All right, folks, up next, Lessons Learned, a pedagogical approach to teaching motorsport history by Quinn Beekwilder and Trey Cunningham. Gentlemen. Thank you. Good afternoon. I teach a 1 o'clock Monday, Wednesday, Friday cl afternoon class, and so I understand the challenges of coming back and talking to a group of people uh, after lunch. So we, we greatly appreciate your attention. Um, my name is Trey Cunningham. I am the chair of sport and motorsport management at Belmont Abbey College. This is my colleague, uh, Quinn Beekwilder. He's our program coordinator for motorsport management. Um, Quinn is, is actually a, an alum of our program and has spent 10 years at Charlotte Motor Speedway uh, working uh, th through many ranks and then we finally got him back. Um, so let's get started. Um, one thing that I would like to, to mention right off, right off the start is that uh, this might seem like a little bit of a self-serving uh, presentation to tell you about our program. However, please note that we, we truly are here to, to learn from you. Um, and as we learn and grow and develop our program, we feel like uh, this group of people can help us um, uh, bring our program to the next level. So a little bit about Belmont Abbey. We are a liberal arts um, Benedictine Catholic College right outside of Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. We have a uh, Bachelor's of Arts degree in Motorsport Management. We currently have 40 students um, that are with us on campus um, for this program. Uh, in the fall, we are starting um, a pending uh, SAC COC approval, if the academics in here know what I'm talking about, our commission, um, our accrediting commission. Um, we are starting an online MBA with a concentration in motorsport management. Our program specifically um, focuses on um, business management, communications, marketing, financial, and operation sides of motorsport uh, industry. Um, we, we do have a, a little bit of a history as well. Um, one of our, we, we say our founding uh, fathers of the program is uh, super promoter Humpy Wheeler. His father is, um, has been associated with the school uh, for a very long time, was a coach and athletic director at Belmont Abbey. Um, our, the first course was called Racing Management in 2007, so we have been teaching classes for um, a little over 15 years, uh, revolving around the business side of racing. Uh, we really got a, a nice break in promotion uh, when um, the Wall Street Journal published an article. Uh, it was referred to as the Grease Monks. Um, once again, we are a Benedictine college, and uh, it's owned by uh, Benedictine monks. Um, and that was published in October 2007, and so that gave us a lot of uh, nice publicity um, to the start of the program. We have... Um, uh, several guiding principles, and I'm going to start with the middle one first, and that is uh, to create and maintain a deep integration and connection with the motorsport industry. Obviously, we are uh, located in Greater Charlotte. We consider Charlotte a great, uh, a great location um, and, and center f for motorsports here in the United States and maybe even globally. Uh, and so, uh, we, we, we are continuously out uh, trying to build and create these, um, these connections uh, with the industry, much like the reason that we're here uh, in Watkins Glen. Um, the next one would be provide a sustainable experiential learning and networking opportunities for our students. We believe this is very important for them to get, uh, for them to get their foot in the door and um, have wonderful experiences, uh, network with industry professionals, and, and learn from that standpoint. We, we require our students to do internships, and um, m most of them do multiple internships at multiple uh, locations in the Charlotte area or back home. And then lastly, um, uh, we, we feel deeply, um, we feel that it's deeply important to uh, develop the entire student, right? Um, it's guided by our faith of, as a Catholic college, um, and then all, obviously some of the Benedictine hallmarks of stewardship, community, and discipline. And this is where the, the history portion of, um, of the program comes in, is that we, uh, we believe that 
um, the students should learn the history of the motorsport industry um, so that they are able to be, be good stewards um, as um, that is being handed over, um, the industry has been handing over to them as well. So um, these are our guiding principles and um, Mr. Beekwater will now talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the, the actual classes that we have related to history. All right, thank you very much. Um, so really, uh, I chose this quote here by Burr McIntosh, who was originally a photographer and early magazine producer in the early 1900s. The comment you know, talks about the big far-reaching sport that was just developing, and he knew it was going to be a constant source of delight, satisfaction, and pride to us all. And he was witnessing at the time the speed trials being held at Ormond Beach. And this is you know, kind of where it began. So how do we cover a sport that started in 1894 in 16 weeks? Hmm, it's going to be tricky. So I, as I usually tell my students, buckle up. <laughs> so the first, we cover the many different aspects of motorsports. I try to give an entire approach from the start all the way through up to last weekend's race. So really, I reach far back. I talk about the Gordon Bennett Cup, you know, whose equivalent prize money would be around $2.3 million for winning an absolutely astounding amount of money. The first time that motorsports was really threatened to even, you know, to be canceled, if you will. Uh, the Paris-Madrid race of 1903. You had 224 cars that entered. Within the first 350 miles, half the field was out, and unfortunately, eight people were dead. The government of France steps in, stops the whole event, never even makes it to, to Spain. Uh, and it would be oh, nearly 24 years, almost a quarter of a century, before the public road racing would come back again. Uh, the Mille Mille would kind of picked up that torch. Italy kind of gets its rise to fame. A thousand mile race that saw, saw the rise of Ferrari to greats, uh, to greats like Nuvolari. Um, the Targo Floria, or Targo Florio, uh, down in Sicily, you know, having off and on running from 1906 all the way through 1977. Monaco trying to entice people to come visit this small little nation at the bottom of France. Uh, Nürb and the Germans not to be outdone, you know, creating the Nürburgring. Uh, which you can still go for about 20 bucks and drive on yourself today. Uh, so, you know, these are the first great spectacles we talk about. But there are plenty of people that are involved in this. And so we move on to the drivers. But there are so many drivers out there. Who do we cover? Just a, brand, just a brief smitten of who we cover. Um, Tazio Nuvolari, who I mentioned previously, with his impossible victory, with his underpowered Alfa Romeo versus the Germans in the, in the 30s, uh, and also a never-quit attitude. I mean, the story goes that... He was qualifying for a race on motorcycles. He broke both his, both his legs in qualifying, and the next day he had his mechanics strap him to the bike, and he went on to win the darn thing. I mean, that's not that's a never quit attitude. <laughs> uh, Juan Manuel Fangio, you know, at the early day onset as a five time, the only five time, first five time champ really of F1 racing, uh, and still has the winningest percentage of an F1 driver. Uh, AJ Foyt, Foyt, an American driver, the only one to have ever won the Indy and Daytona 500s. Uh, Daytona and Le Mans, 24 hours, and Sebring, 12 hours. Mario Andretti goes from racing in dirt tracks in Pennsylvania to USAC to F1 championships, and then all the way to Pikes Peak. Um, Louis Smith, the first lady of racing. Uh, you know, the story goes that she was at the beach race in 48 and, you know, and was raced the family car and flipped the darn thing. Would go on to win multiple events in different, uh, different formats. Uh, Michael Schumacher, the first seven-time champ, Ayrton Senna, need I say more? And Lewis Hamilton, who still to this day has a 62% chance to podium every time he gets on, gets on to start. Even the other seven-time champ only had about a 50% chance to podium. <laughs> Um, so these are a, a, a sampling of the drivers that we try to cover more in depth, obviously. Uh, but what I really also try to kind of point out is the, Le Mans, uh, the event in Le Mans. Now, they're coming up on their 100th anniversary as far as uh, the racing is not for 100 years, is interrupted by two world wars. But, you know, uh, their 100th anniversary is coming up. There have been so many books and competitions that have kind of like uh, between uh, Ferrari, uh, you know, famously Ferrari and Ford, and Audi versus everyone. Uh, you know, 
Uh, and then also multiple movies have been made, books have come out. There's something enduring about that ultimate question of how far you can go in 24 hours. But it's also really important to touch on the fact that motorsports almost died again in the 55 Le Mans race. And I really try to um, you know, bring that to the students' attention where Hawthorne driving his Jaguar pitted late and unfortunately LeVay driving a Mercedes was launched into the crowd and killing 83 plus people. But the craziest part is the race continues. It was only 35 laps into a 20, 35 minutes into a 24 hour race and it kept going. You know, they're literally dealing with the folks there and the racing still goes. Mercedes would eventually pull out at 2 a.m. and not return to motorsports until 1987. But these are the types of influential things that happened in one event. I mean, Switzerland still doesn't allow motorsport events because of this event. Uh, you know, and so, you know, the, it's a really big, important event. But these tracks, these places that kind of have these hollow ground uh, type, you know, aspirations also kind of what next is we go into tracks themselves. You know, if we say things like Watkins Glen, Sebring, Cirque de la Salle, Brooklands, Monaco, just the words and names themselves kind of conjure up images. But what is it about these places? Is it the, con the surface they actually race on? Oswego, even. Uh, you know, is it the asphalt, the dirt? Uh, is it the banking, the chicanes, the apexes? What makes them so special? Why do people keep returning to them? Why do whole families and generations of people kind of follow through and always attend the same events year after year? There's got to be something special special about them. Uh, and even places like, like Darlington. Um, you know, uh, and, but that kind of rolls into what we teach in, in also as NASCAR. A third-rate joyride for the working class as originally referred to, you know, kind of by the AAA. Um, uh, so, you know, how do you condense all of NASCAR's history uh, into just a few presentations? Well, I try to break it down in three key modules, I, f I feel as. There's the 1936 to 49, where you really have the first family of racing, the flocks, three brothers and a sister who would go on to compete and be the only family of four, really, or four siblings that actually competed on the same track, their sister won, by the way, uh, and, you know, would go on. World War II would intercede. There's so many, uh, you know, uh, so much technology as far as training and such, you know, kind of came out of that for the mechanics that would come back from the war and use their skills to improve the vehicles that they raced in. The first uh, national champion stock car uh, circuit, uh, Bill France's kind of proof of concept uh, run in 1947 that was originally then brought to the streamline to say, hey, I can pay out the money, I can run the races, I can do the insurance, let's go ahead and form this next thing that we're going to call NASCAR. And then the next big, uh, big iteration, 1950 to 71, Dar little Darlington, South Carolina, getting a super speedway. You know, 1950, the first track is super speedway is built in NASCAR, and it's a funny little shape if you ever really see it. And the reason because there was a minnow pond on a corner that they sort of shifted the track because the landowner didn't want to ruin his minnow pond. Um, and also the guy who won, eventually won the race, because NASCAR had never done a 500 mile race. 50 miles, 100 miles, that was their bread and butter. Uh, but it was a guy who'd competed in Indy and used truck tires to actually beat them all out. Um, you know, Carl Kiefer, the kind of the first Rick Hendrick, bring matching uniforms, uh, painted up trucks. You know, he owned Mercury Outboard Motors. Uh, you know, he's the first one to bring in a, you know, an African American driver into his team as well. Um, you know, we talk about the big three leaving. Basically, 1955 was starting to get a little rocky for uh, big companies being involved in motorsports and unfortunately fans perishing. And then a race in West Virginia or in Martinsville actually kind of another two or three fans died and then the big three kind of stepped out of the way. And so that was a big gaping hole. We talk about the second family of racing, the Lees, and how Winston, uh, Winston Cigarettes, how they lose TV advertising, and the, but they got NASCAR. You know? and, and then so that was a big change to our sport as well. 1972 to present was that last kind of big block of time where a blizzard brings NASCAR to the masses. Uh, lights, you know, under one hot night, all of a sudden go night racing. Professionalism in, uh, professionalism in the pit crew with the Rainbow Warriors. Of course, Dale Earnhardt Sr.'s death. Uh, Jimmy Seven time and development of the cup car, NASCAR media, and the Francis. You know, these are some of the things we touch on to kind of cover the history. We go a little bit more in depth with NASCAR because that's kind of where we're at. 
Um, we do also cover open wheel racing in, in, um, in our class. We mainly focus on the first Indy 500 and really the splits between AAA leaving, USAC forming, CART and USAC, CART IRL, Champ Car World Series, and then finally the reunification in the, Indy, uh, in the Indy Car Series as is today. We also try to ask the question, if they had stayed together throughout that entire time period, would they be more popular and keep in a, uh, kept a consistent fan base to be more popular than NASCAR is today? Or, because of all these splits and uh, disunification, was that, did that give NASCAR a chance to rise up and you know, kind of beat them out at their own game? Uh, for attention, that is. Uh, we also cover the NHRA, so kind of all the impetus of what's happening on the West Coast. Everything that kind of happened on the East Coast, we just previously talked about. But really it was the, um, all this talent coming back from the wars, guys who had worked on planes and tanks and trucks, were now tinkering with old cars and you know, making them go faster. Southern California Timing Association is informed, formed around 1948. Uh, they hold their first land speed trials out in the Bonneville Salt Flats. C.J. Pappy Hart takes a spare side runway at the, and creates the Santa Ana drags. Wally Park sees all this. He had been involved with time trials, creates the NHRA, and they go racing. You know, they, they have their first event in Pomona in 53, and by the middle, of, then they have their championship in the middle of everywhere, trying it in Great Bend, Kansas by 55. The safety safari, spreading this gospel of speed across the entire country. You know, when all these places wanted to have that badge of NHRA and drag racing, they traveled to these locations and made sure that they qualified for the insurance coverages, you know, and made sure that things were safe. And of course, Dar Darren Garlett and his funky rear engine, you know, who would have thought about that? I think he was tired of losing feet. Um, but. You know, uh, so that's the type of history that we cover in our class in 16 weeks. I'm going to turn it a little bit over to Dr. Cunningham again. That was a lot. Yeah. I don't think I could pass that uh, final exam. Uh, you, so you can tell the depth that Quinn goes, does a wonderful job um, teaching these undergraduate students with this MM200 class. Um, so really the next question and the reason that we're here is, you know, how do we reinforce these historical concepts uh, throughout the rest of the entire curriculum. Um, and so we wanted to go from instructed, instructivism to constructivism uh, through several different methods, right? Uh, we use uh, case studies. Uh, one of our adjunct uh, instructors is Vice President of Communications and Marketing for Roush Fenway Keselowski. Um, and he was there during the Ryan Newman uh, incident. Um, uh, and so Kevin brings some of those experiences back into the classroom and then also compares that to other historical events such as Ryan Newman's uh, uh, wreck several years ago. Uh, we also bring in, uh, we rely he very heavily on guest speakers. It's many of the times that it's, uh, they have topics related to history. Uh, another one of our adjuncts is Matt Yoakum. Uh, he teaches our sport broadcasting class, and he brings in uh, Pam Miller, Daryl Waltrip, um, uh, a lot of um, uh, very uh, well-known names who, who come in and talk about the importance of uh, the most sport history. Um, running a little short of time here, but we also do reflection papers and presentations that reflect back on where we are now, where we are, what they have seen today in today's society and it tracks and how um, it was in the past. Um, so, um, bef before COVID, we did a little bit of travel. We did a little of engaging of the senses, as I like to say, um, you know, being there at the track, understanding uh, uh, what is taking place in the media center, many of those types of things. We did some networking, and um, we also tried to, to teach the students how, how important it was that they are needing to be able to adapt to change. However, um, during COVID, uh, Quinn and I were, I wouldn't say we were bored, but we were very anxious to move our program forward. Um, and we came up with some ideas to, to go from a, 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 a motorsport program 1.0 to motorsport program 2.0. And so um, we wanted to um, find a way to bring the history to life. Um, and we, we kind of wrote down some challenges. One was um, we wanted the students to recognize what makes something um, a spectacle or entertaining so that people will spend money within the industry. Um, we wanted to find ways to network 
uh, with influencers outside of our, our normal bubble of Charlotte. Um, uh, we wanted the students to experience um, the endurance, the, the physical endurance and the flexibility that is required to be a part of a, a, a weekend race. Um, observe tracks during the operations and most importantly we wanted them to see the history that we that we've taught them in the past um, that we wanted them to contrast that with business models how business models have evolved um, over time so that um, they're aware of they're all the ones that are evolving future business models um, in their career so here's the plan that we came up with so I approached Trey toward the end of 21 saying we need to go to more races and so I told him my idea for one to two races, and he said, Let, you know what, let's make a class out of it. So we created the MM390 Professional Development in Motorsport. We picked several events that we thought we, that were not as fully packed or, contain, or, or as attended as other events would be. If we go to the Daytona 500, FaceTime with executives or you know, people actually who kind of would matter for their networking career for our students would be unavailable. But places like the 24 hour of a Rolex at Daytona, there's a lot more flexibility. Same thing with like the Indy race at Texas Motor Speedway and even the four wide nationals at ZMAX Dragway. And so that's what we did. We went, we traveled. We created a class, we took 10, we took 10 students, put them, put them in vans, and we drove down to Florida. So we drove down to Florida and we got to experience, you know, we met with George Levy who runs the Motorsport Hall of Fame of America. Uh, got a fantastic tour from him. Uh, and then he all, we mentioned that we were actually going to the North Turn Grill. And he said, you know what, I know someone who's doing a fantastic radio show called Legends of Racing by Buzz McKim. Uh, and, said, <laughs> and said, why don't you guys head on down there and check it out. And the next day, there we were. It was a fantastic show, Buzz. <laughs> um, you know, and while we were there and learning about that, they told us that there was still a portion of the old A1A that was still part of the original uh, dirt, uh, you know, the original beach and road course that you kind of can see there. Uh, and we traveled down there. Uh, I did lose into a foot race to, with my students, but you know that's okay. Um, you know, and so we went to the Streamline Hotel where NASCAR was founded, and it's really you know just noticing and really living and experiencing that history that they had taught about and been read about and took a test on, but we're now actually seeing it physically and in person. Uh, we also were able to connect with a lot of industry leaders from uh, from Tom Doonan to Kevin Kennedy uh, with Ford Performance uh, Marketing, uh, some of our own grads who are in NASCAR actually, uh, and Haley Deegan, we, give it, we got hot laps with her, and because it was kind of a less attended event, the students actually got to interview her for a student project, um, got invited in the garage from GMG Racing, saw the entire uh, Jackson Marketing runs, all the Michelin tires and wheels uh, with Scott Taylor, he showed us around, and so the whole back end of like what goes on for the races, and it was just really kind of that in-depth field, the different fields they can go into, the different positions they could have, uh, the different experiences they can go with. Then we also went to, out to Texas Motor Speedway. It was a very long drive, but a very fulfilling drive. Um, we stopped by Talladega Speedway at the McKaig Wilborn Research Library and also the International Motorsport Hall of Fame. Um, saw a vast collection that was out there and one of the most more NASCAR things we saw, there were two urns right by the right-hand side of that sign, just sort of left out there. Um, it's a very NASCAR thing to do. Uh, and, and once we got to Texas itself, uh, Rom Ramage was able to kind of give us the keys to the kingdom. He was the president of the track at the time. And we met with all his top level executives who run, you know, from marketing to PR uh, to track operations and basically experience a phenomenal weekend. And I'll turn it over to Trey to wrap things up here. So we learned a lot. And, and we, were, we were very tired uh, after the spring as well. Um, but we, we, these, we're still in the, in the process of developing, uh, really uh, fleshing out this more about what actually uh, was learned, right? Uh, one is we, we learned that the more flexible that we were, um, the, the, it ended up creating more learning opportunities. We had meetings set up at specific times throughout the specific um, uh, events and all of a sudden we'd get a text or a phone call saying, hey, I was supposed to meet you at 9 a.m., but I'm not, now I'm not available till 11.30, okay? So what do we do? How do we, how do we move 10 people around um, the pits? Um, it, it, we needed to be very flexible. This, this, the students need to learn that because that's real life um, experience. Uh, we also realized that professionalism uh, is now a priority. The first couple of events that we went to, students showed up in their, uh, they, what they refer to as their vintage Mark Martin shirts. And um, we then decided we we're gonna 
get all the students uh, polos and jackets and we're going to try to at least buy them some professionalism buy them some confidence um, along the way so when we showed up places we looked we looked a little bit like we we belong there we might not have but um, so we were really instilling that professionalism within our students uh, from day one we totally reinvigorated our alumni we had we had alumni that started seeing things on social media uh, alumni we didn't even know we had uh, they were they came out of the woodworks um, and have been very supportive um, for example mike lajeda is the vice president of um, corporate sales at nascar in daytona he actually took time away from his um, his day and gave us a personal tour of um, that area around the NASCAR, NASCAR building. Um, we realized how important it was that uh, building a, a family and a team atmosphere was um, in, in cohesion. These students are going to be spending the rest of their lives uh, in the industry and no, no better networking and connection than their own classmates that they set 12 hours in a van with. Um, it, we also realized that we needed to stop doing things with juniors and seniors and start focusing on the freshmen and sophomore. And so what we've been able to do is align um, all classes from the very first day that a student enters uh, um, on campus to the day that they graduate. They all work um, and move uh, together um, in many of those activities. Um, and most importantly, the thing that we we thought was going to be the most difficult actually became the easiest, and that was that um, industry professionals were more than willing to give their time, to give back, to give advice, um, to be flexible themselves. And it was, it was quite the blessing um, in those events. Uh, we have a lot of other great things planned. Uh, Quinn and I truly believe that there's someone or several of you in this room um, that will help us bring our program to the next level. So we look forward um, over the next two days to, to speak to many of you, to hear your ideas on how we can move, uh, move this forward. All right, that's the end of our presentation. Do we have any time for questions? Yes, I think I left the microphone on the Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions? Yes, okay, coming back to you. So, quick question: yep. How useful has you, have you found the NASCAR Hall of Fame in to helping you in your program? Oh, oh absolutely! Um, the NASCAR Hall of Fame is is in Charlotte. Uh, we we take multiple trips there a year. Um, one of the class that that Quinn teaches the. MM200 History, Culture, and Philosophy of Sport. There's, a, there's an annual trip for all of those students uh, in the spring. Uh, there, and there's a lot of events that take place. I think just last week, the E-NASCAR uh, championships were held at the, um, at the Hall of Fame. Dale Jr. was there to present the, the award. The students were there, got the pictures with them. It was a great event. So we, we do utilize the NASCAR Hall of Fame, which is we're super, super blessed to have it so close. Uh, we, we utilize it as much as we possibly can. I have a quick question about the buy-in from your colleagues at the university. Um, how, how hard a sell was this when you approached the university administration and said, we want to do a motorsports, a motorsports degree? Um, it seems like, I, I know the institution where I teach, it would be uh, them's fighting words to, uh, to try and come up with that kind of a, a program. But I'm just curious as to uh, how smoothly things went for you folks yeah super super smooth once again um, humpy Wheeler was on our board of directors and in, in uh, 15 years ago and introduced that concept to our president dr. Thierfelder um, our entire administration is fully aligned and gives us uh, our administration doesn't know about a lot of this stuff to be honest with you right um, <laughs> but but what a what a blessing we we don't they, they trust that we're going to do what's right for the students in that overall that as long as we're developing the whole student um, beyond just what's in the classroom then we don't really have much uh, kickback and our provost was the former uh, sport and motorsport management uh, chair like myself uh, so we, we have a full support from top to bottom 
I was just going to say I wish this program had existed 50 some years ago. I used to have to cut classes to go to races. <laughs> and now I could actually take it as a curriculum. They, Where they were you guys back then? <laughs> yeah, they, they do st still cut classes. Um, <laughs> it, Every once in a while, every once in a while, we'll, I'll have to call a professor uh, that's um, that's kind of questioning why they're missing so much. And I'll say, this is super important. Um, this young lady is about to go meet Lynn St. James um, at the Women with Drive conference a couple of weeks ago. And I promise you, this could change the trajectory of her career. Could you please let her take that exam at another time? Just another quick one. Uh, what's the future you're laying out? I know that uh, you've got a good groundwork. I'm very impressed to be very, very honest about it. So what you're uh, laying the groundwork in, uh, and where are you going to be going in the future uh, expansions? Um, I think what we're focusing on for the future is really kind of that re-engagement of the alumni. That we have a lot of success stories who are out there in industry already. Um, I think there was a lack of reaching out to the alumni earlier. And so just re-engagement of them, kind of bringing that, them back in the program, and a focus more on that team building aspect so that once you graduate, those juniors, sophomores, and freshmen can reach out to you and then say, hey, I'd really like to come shadow you. I'd like to you know, see what that experience is like and create you know, just a cycle of kind of you know, rinse and repeat, if you will. Um, really you know, uh, emphasizing these uh, early spring classes where we go on the trips you know, is really important to us uh, to establish those networks and try to grow them um, and then just kind of solidify the foundation we're at you know, um, and kind of keep growing from there. And the numbers are showing it. So. Which and is good. Our, our MBA with a concentration of yeah, motorsports will be fully online. So we're looking to expand with uh, instructors, fully online, uh, remote instructors as well as uh, remote students as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. We'll see where that goes. Yeah. Do you have any involvement with the uh, mechanical and restoration aspects, or do you leave that to other uh, institutions? Yeah, we kind of UNC Charlotte is right in our backyard, and they have a phenomenal engineering program. Um, that's something that we're kind of not set up for. Uh, you know, we don't have the facilities at all uh, to teach engineering or to, uh, you know, turn wrenches. We would like to, but you know, it's really we're so, more focused on the soft skills um, rather than the hands-on skills. Although our students do have their own lemons team that they run themselves, so. You know, whether the car makes it there or not is totally up to them. <laughs> so. so you said you covered uh, open wheel and circle track and a couple different asphalt uh, cars, yeah. but you didn't say anything about dirt. Um, why don't you cover that and do you think that limits your students? Yeah, we do actually have a handful of um, actual people who race dirt themselves who come through our program. Uh, you know, I did have to cut a little bit of my presentation short for time-wise. Um, we do cover, you know, the world of outlaws is right in our backyard. Um, you know, the, the finals are this weekend, uh, you know, being run at Charlotte. And, um, you know, we do love dirt too. Uh, but, you know, as far as, you know, kind of coming up northeast, uh, that is definitely something that we can start including into, like talking about Oswego and Eldora. Um, you know, there's a, that's why it's difficult to cover motorsport history uh, as a whole, you know, you can have an entire semester dedicated to dirt in its various formats uh, and racing. So it's not that we don't like dirt. Uh, we'd, we'd love dirt. Um, you know, I love taking Q-tip and getting that mud out of my ears after an event. Um, but, you know, it's just, you know, something that we cover, we do briefly cover. So. Well, it sounds like initially the program was, was more based on the management side, but you're starting to delve more into exploring the history of racing. Um, and I was curious, um, as far as job placement, um, what, 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 is there any type, do you have any type of figures as far as job placement, like what percentage of your graduates wind up landing positions in NASCAR or if they're finding positions in other types of motorsports? Mm -hmm. And then finally, what are maybe one or two of the, the types of jobs that they're, they're being hired to do? Because you mentioned UNC Charlotte, they, they have the, the technical school, the engineering school. Um, uh, you mentioned Mike Lahetta, great guy, um, one year alumni, because uh, he was at, I believe he was at the NASCAR Hall of Fame before he went over to NASCAR. Um, are there more stories like Mike? Can you provide some more examples of the types of jobs and the, and the, and the amount of placement, percentage of placement you've had with the program? Yeah. 
So uh, when I was digging into the alumni, trying to, we did a alumni mixer and networking event last year as part of this professional development program the students put together. Um, and basically combing through all the records and trying to figure out everyone through their LinkedIn pages and just trying to reach out and contact them. Uh, we have oh, roughly over 100 graduates or so um, in that time span. Uh, and about half are actually had made it to the industry, uh, or were still in the industry, I should say. Uh, about three quarters made it to the industry. Some spent a year or two, three years or so, then moved on to another job. Um, you know, but the majority seem to have, are still enjoying themselves. Uh, we've had graduates, you know, the ones uh, is a, you know, one of the head managers at, you know, Victory Karting, which is a local karting establishment and, you know, keeps that ongoing. Um, we have other grads, uh, Ian Moy, who's now over Penske's uh, uh, social media. Uh, he was Ryan Blaney's PR rep for multiple years, but he started out as um, an advisor at Belmont. You know, a job hadn't opened up right then, but he stuck with it. You know, he kind of persevered through. Um, others, you know, yeah, Jordan Anderson is also one of our grads. Um, so, you know, he came from a you know, dirt, dirt and late model type experience uh, all the way through to now owning his own team. Um, and, uh, you know, we have uh, Morgan Overstreet was Chase Elliott's rep. She's now with uh, Dirty Mo Media. Um, several folks over at Junior Motorsports as well. Um, a lot of PR reps, a lot of social media reps. Um, and actually, uh, uh, the marketing director for Hoosier Tires is one of our one of our grads. Uh, Taylor Hole, a professional drift racer, uh, was one of our grads back in the day. Um, and then also, uh, a lot have ended up at uh, Charlotte, uh, myself included. You know, I spent 10 years there. Tom Vesey, who's in charge of operations, is also there. A uh, gal down in PR, uh, PRN kind of runs their boards. So it's a wide variety of grads all over the industry, uh, but mostly on the soft skill sides. Hi, you mentioned uh, 40 students in the program currently. What are you hoping to get, and how do the students find you? How do you promote the program? Because this is obviously a very unique niche. Yeah, that is the million dollar question. Um, you know, because it is so unique, um, it's hard to kind of go to Google Analytics and select college student motorsport management, let me spend my money. Um, so in that respect, it's a lot of word of mouth. Um, we're starting to find out that a lot more folks, and kind of like myself, originally I came from California, I had no contacts in the industry, heard about this program, you required three, at the time, three internships, and then, you know, you had these connections, and it's like, hey, I want to get into this industry that's very small and tight-knit, they have connections, that's probably how I should spend my money. Uh, and that is kind of a recurring theme. So we have people from, you know, got two students from New Jersey, one from England, one from uh, Vermont, some from Oregon and uh, Arizona and, you know, Michigan. And so people- One from the Finger Lakes? Yeah, one from the Finger Lakes actually, just right up the road. Um, and so all these uh, experiences of, I really want to be in it, I know where I have to be to go to it, you know, uh, be having that large, we, we always tell them we never guarantee them a job, but we'll give you the best chance of getting a job in the industry. 90% um, of all NASCAR teams are based in there. We have the World of Outlaw Finals based there as well. Um, and I, you know, and so uh, there are a lot of organizations and support, uh, Stock Car Steel, uh, Hypeco, um, you know, just a lot of support industries that are around our areas too, um, that some of our students have ended up in as well. And as far as additional students, uh, you know, we'd love more, but we know that at some point there's going to be, you know, a larger cap. You know, if we can't have 100 people. How can we guarantee them jobs if 50 people are graduating to get in the industry? That's kind of probably unattainable. Um, so, but currently, uh, you know, we just had a rise kind of, we had nine, nine come incoming last year, 15 this year, and so we're seeing our numbers definitely increase dramatically, uh, and we're ready and willing to accept them and teach them. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Trey and Quinn. Much appreciated.